all the memory of rainy afternoons, swingy Harlem tunes, motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and prunes. How lovely it was. for the memory of candlelight and wine, castles on the run. My name is Jenny Davis. I am one of the wound ostomy nurses here at Audie Murphy. I am a geriatric nurse practitioner. This is my partner, Kip Jacobson. He's a family nurse practitioner, and he's also the other certified wound ostomy nurse, and he also has a certification in foot care. This afternoon, for the first hour, we're going to be discussing lower extremity wounds, differentiation, and treatment. Quickly, I'll review our objectives. Sorry. Our first objective is to identify key factors to be included in assessment of the lower extremity with the wound, understand the critical parameters of wound assessment, Describe typical assessment findings of venous insufficiency, arterial, and neuropathic ulcerations, and list principles of wound care, and explain rationale for each when treating a venous, arterial, and neuropathic wound. So why are we discussing today? Well, as you can see by the numbers up here, many people are affected with these types of wounds. I will say in our clinic, about 80 to 90 percent of the wounds that we see are due to some venous uh, insufficiency or a wound that has delayed healing because of a venous component. Go down. Sorry. I'm trying to get used to this microphone. But not only are these numbers big, but that last number six, quality of life. These wounds, they drain. They train. Can y'all hear me like that? Okay. They're drained. They have an odor. There's frequent clinic visits. They sometimes are. They feel isolated and can't go back to work. So really, the psychosocial is a huge effect with these wounds as well. So part one, we'll be discussing etiology and assessment. That's better, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I feel normal. How much I care now? Okay. So let's first discuss the normal patterns of venous blood flow. There's the deep system, which consists of the femoral, popliteal, and tibial veins. These veins lie within the muscle compartment, and they are milked by the calf muscle contraction. This is a very high pressure system. The superficial or saphenous system located with the subcutaneous tissues, they collect from the skin and soft tissue, and this is a low pressure system. Then we have perforator or communicating <coughs> veins. We have about 90 of these. And these connect the superficial and deep veins. Now the why we typically see and why this last sentence is important, our typical venous ulceration occurs around the medial malleolus area. And a good reason why it could be is because the perforator veins are in direct contact. They're not surrounded by fascia. So when there's an increased venous pressure, increased congestion, this could definitely lead to damage here. And around this gator area is where we typically see a venous wound. So the normal venous function is characterized by a high standing pressure, but a low walking pressure. When we walk, the contraction of our calf muscle compresses the deep veins and propels blood back to the heart. This significantly reduces the pressure. The one-way valves that assure unidirectional blood flow from the periphery back to the heart. So this is the system. So I'm standing here in a dependent position and it makes it a higher pressure system. When I'm walking, going around, again, that pump action of the calf's muscle is gonna propel all that blood, blood back to my heart and those one-way valves shut it to prevent backflow. So lower extremity venous disease. So let's talk about the uh, pathology of this. So, so there becomes a congestion in the deep venous system. 
which distends the veins and then pulls the leaflets of the valves apart. So if the vein is a tube, the valve inside the veins are supposed to act like a trap door. So when we're walking, they open and close tightly. All the blood is propelled back. But with this congestion that start occurring, the valve becomes incompetent and the end result is backflow of blood from the deep system to the superficial veins. And this is what is defined as venous insufficiency. And then the transmission of the deep venous system to the superficial veins is what we know as ambulatory hypertension. So there are many theories, but it's still very poorly understood why some people with venous disease will lead to an ulcer and why some don't. But the bottom line is that long-standing venous insufficiency causes changes in the tissue that make them more susceptible to trauma and ulceration. And these are just a few of the theories. As you can see, others, I mean a lot of others. So it's a, a poorly understood mechanism of why some people will uh, develop an ulcer. So lower extremity arterial disease. Atherosclerosis is the most common cause of arterial disease in the lower extremity. When the high levels of circulating lipids, they will cause endothelial damage that triggers platelet activation and secretion of growth factors. The end result is a steadily enlarging plaque and thickening of the vessel wall. That makes the lumen become more narrow and it leads to obstruction and the loss of the vessel elasticity. So now we get this fixed rate. You have not only a artery that's filled with plaque, but it also stiffens. So the opening is no longer as large as it used to be. So when our meta uh, metabolic needs change, that artery is unable to compensate for it because of this pathology. Um, other conditions, there's some degenerative disorders, connective tissue disorders, vasculitis, um, vasospastic, vasospastic diseases such as Raynaud's. And then we have lower extremity neuropathic disease. Neuropathy is most commonly associated with diabetes, and there's three most common types. First is sensory, and that's damage to the nerves that mediate sensation. So it's first associated with paresthesis, you have that tingling, burning, and then it progresses to an anesthesia where it's total loss of sensation. So this is where we see the people that don't realize they stepped on a nail a month ago. Um, they're at really high risk for painless repetitive trauma from proper fitting shoes, burns, or trauma with going barefoot. <coughs> the motor is damages to nerves that control the muscles of the foot. This is associated with muscle atrophy, foot and toe deformities, and altered weight bearing. So things with the motor neuropathy can lead to calluses, plantar surface ulcers, we also see hammer toes, claw toes, thinning of the fat pads over the metal tarsal head, which can put them at higher risk for an ulcer. And then autonomic is damage to the nerve that control the sweat glands and the diameter of the blood vessels. The loss of sweating causes feet to fissures and crack. Of course, that allows bacteria to be introduced. The increased blood flow results in osteopenia, a patient at high risk for fracture with minor stress or trauma. Now this, uh, there's a symptom and there's a picture here of uh, Charcot foot. If that initial fracture is not recognized and the patient continues to walk on the foot, they get progressive damage from additional fractures, the collapse of the normal architectures, and this is what we'll see here, and that's a typical um, Charcot's foot. Assessment. You always want to take a thorough assessment, of course, of any of your patients, but there are specific uh, comorbidities we're looking for in our lower extremity wounds. Um, people who have had a deep vein thrombosis, a DVT, 
have a sedentary lifestyle, obesity, a diminished range of motion at the ankle joint. These are typical comorbidity diagnoses that you would see with someone that has uh, venous disease. Arterial disease, any history of cardiac disease, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. Neuropathic, again, there's that diabetes, alcoholism, B12 deficiency. And also we include CHF because that's a big one we see in our clinic. You're trying to control someone's lower extremity swelling, and if they are just retaining fluid, let's say they say, oh, I've gained 30 pounds in two months, then that's not too many cookies. That is all fluid. It there is just caused weeping of the legs, blistering. So CHF, we always want to make sure that it's compensated, that it's under control. And we always ask about weight with that one. Social history, again, smoking, alcohol use. Um, not only does smoking give you a risk of developing arterial disease, but also smoking will um, does not help in wound healing. It will delay wound healing. Uh, occupation, are you on your feet all day, a waitress, a nurse? Um, are you, do you have a job that your legs are at risk for trauma? We have guys that are um, lifting cement blocks, you know, one falls off. So what's the occupation that is important? The surgical history, prior surgeries, have you had open heart surgery, a bypass, any type of vein stripping, uh, of course, amputations. So that kind of triggers that there's already a, a pre-existing disease in the extremities. And then family history, we ask a lot about, um, especially the mothers to other women, you know, we always talk about how our legs look, so do you have uh, varicose veins, any history of swelling? There's actually many studies suggest that there's a pretty strong co uh, genetic component to the lower extremity venous disease. Okay, now I'm gonna hand it over to Mr. Jacobson. Assessment now, uh, physical assessment, and a little bit about some about labs and uh, some imaging assessments. This I, I can't uh, emphasize. You all are providers. You know how important assessment is. A good assessment will really put you on the right track of figuring out what is wrong with that patient who comes in with a lower extremity wound. And putting you down the right path will prevent um, uh, a lot of wasted time and frustration, and it'll get the uh, patient on the right track and towards healing. So when we're uh, assessing the lower extremity, we are looking at numbers of things. First thing, you just kind of sit back, and you want uh, you want to uh, you want to be able to see both extremities. You want to see both feet. You want to see uh, all the toes. And you just kind of sit back for a second and just compare. Um, are they symmetric? Is one larger than the other? Is the hair distribution symmetric? Is the color symmetric? You look at all that symmetry, not just size, but you look at all, all of the, the shape, the color, hair distribution, all those things. Look for scars that, that would um, clue you in something that may have been go going on. For instance, we've had patients we, um, they didn't tell us that they had a compound fracture um, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. We have a wound that's not healing, but there's there's a scar there, and uh, so then they haven't told us about the compound fracture. We ask them, well, that helps us, and it will lead us to getting certain uh, diagnostics. For instance, that we probably wouldn't get if, they did, if we did, that scar wasn't seen or they didn't have a compound fracture. So compare limbs. Look for, um, is, is the leg uh, have skin that's thickening or thinning? And again, you want to compare the legs, but you also want to look for thick or thin skin. We get that thick skin a lot of times with venous hypertension or, or venous insufficiency. Um, there's a lot of um, fi fibrosis occurring. Sometimes um, you see that with lymphedema, you see that that fibrotic skin, that thick skin, when you push on it, it it's, he has edema, but it's not fitting. That's, that's from a, a venous insufficiency causing um, 
fiber and deposits on the underside of the skin and thickening it up. We might see thinning skin in uh, arterial, arterial uh, um, and ischemic legs. They don't have the nutrition, they don't have the oxygen, they don't have the reparative factors there, and their skin may be thin. Or you might see a combination. Of course, we look for edema. And many times, there's one, one leg that has more edema than the other, and that, that's important to note. Is the one who had, that has more edema, is that the one with the wound, or is it the other one with the wound? That's important to know, notice. Also with the edema, you want to see where is, where is the swelling. Is it, is it in the feet? If it's in the feet, is it in the toes and the foot? Where does the swelling end? Much of the time it ends at the knee. But does it go beyond the knee? Does it go up into the thigh? And sometimes up into that abdomen? That's important to know, especially when it comes to compression and uh, the treatment that you'll, you'll look at down the road. Also, you know how much edema. Is it, is it low? Is it up to the knee? Um, it's gonna, start, start um, plugging clues into what's causing the, uh, the problem. Of course, variscosities. And those are the superficial veins that Jenny was mentioning just a minute ago that are, um, the, the valves are incompetent in those veins. You have pooling and such. Loss of hair. Loss of hair is a, a pretty sensitive, uh, um, when you have somebody who has an ischemic leg, ischemic foot, it's very seldom that they'll have any hair on there. So loss of hair is an important thing to, uh, to look for. If they have something that may look like an arterial ulcer, arterial wound, but they, they've just got all kinds of hair in their legs and feet, could have an arterial wound, but there's a good chance that something else is going on. All this is important. Hemosiderin staining. Hemosiderin staining. Hemo, you see the word hemo in there, and siderin. And this is basically iron staining, iron, kind of an iron tattoo of the lower leg. In Venus, states of venous hypertension, what happens is that uh, erythrocytes, the uh, red blood cells are leaking out of those blood vessels, and they leak out into the tissue, along with the other fluids. At night when the patient props their leg up, a lot of the other fluids are reabsorbed, but the red blood cells stay out there in the tissue. They, uh, they die, and a lot of the red blood cell is absorbed, but the heme, or the, the iron, is left behind, and you start to get this a brownish, um, dark red stain. It's called hemosiderin staining. Um, this this is not an uncommon finding. We have patients that come and see us, and uh, they have these dark hemosiderin stained legs. And we, we ask them, well, now how long have you been swelling for? And they say two weeks. Well, that you know they've got these markers that say no. It's, you know it's, it's probably a year or two or more. Um, so it's important to understand. The patient, for instance, the patient can have mild swelling or moderate swelling. Just in the last two weeks, he's had severe swelling. He hadn't noticed the, mo the mild or moderate swelling that contributed to the, the, um, the leakage of those erythrocytes that contributed to the hemosiderin staining. So it's important to uh, as, uh, help, help us understand what, what the, the process has been going on, how long it's been going on. And dermatitis and rashes, very common, very common. We will see people who have uh, dermatitis, stasis dermatitis, and what that will look like. Of course, you have the, the normal one that uh, you'll see around the ankle in the, in the leg, but we commonly see people who come in with thick crusts. Sometimes the leg even smells is because of this exudate that has just built up and built up and built up. Um, people will complain of a dry leg. Many of the times, maybe most of the time, it's what, what's dry is that there, there's a kind of a subacute dermatitis that's weeping and it, it is causing the scaling on the skin. It's important to uh, see that is, are they itching? You see scratch marks along, the, along those uh, in, inside that, that scaling that's going on inside their leg. This is important um, as the as we start to treat these venous ulcers because we want to have healthy we call peri wound skin. And if there's just a lot of inflammation going on around that, that we don't recognize, we don't treat, um, then that, that's, that unhealthy skin, that inflamed skin, may not want to crawl across the wound like, like it's supposed to. So we want to identify those, that dermatitis, we want to start treating it along with the wound. 
so we have healthy hairy wound skin as well as uh, so long as we treat the wound. Again, it's very common and, and a lot of times it's misdiagnosed as uh, dry skin. We want to check the capillary refill. Go down to those toes and we, we press it, it blanches. How long does it take to, to get that, that color back? Normally, it should take around uh, about less than three seconds. Venus filling. We may do this a number of ways. They may be sitting with their leg up like this or, or elevated. And we, we, we drop it down. And you're, with venous filling, you want to watch the, the veins on the dorsal part of the foot and see how long does it take to fill up. With, you're going to have a real decrease in uh, the time to be you know, a lengthening of time when you have arterial disease. So you want to check it out. It takes uh, 15 to 20 seconds normally for those, um, or under 15 to 20 seconds for those uh, veins to fill up normally. With arterial disease, it's going to take a lot longer. So you want to check capillary refill. You want to check venous filling. The dependent rubber that's seen with uh, poor circulation also. Again, you've got them, you're looking at both of their legs, you're looking at their feet, toes. The dependent rubber you're going to see a kind of a purplish maroon color. Is it on both feet, one foot? Uh, you want to make a note of that too. With the, with the poor arterial circulation, you'll see that. You want to get your hands on the person too, right? So um, you want to feel for pulses. Are pulses palpable or not? Not finding a pulse sometimes doesn't mean anything. Because we've had people with no, absolutely normal arterial flow many, many times where we can't palpate a pulse. Especially when, you're, when they have, come with they have edema in their feet and legs. Um, normally we feel that dorsalis um, pedis pulse or the posterior tibial pulse. And if you can't find them, that's not you know anything to worry about. If you find them, that, that's great. You want to be able to find them. When they have a lot of edema, um, they, you may not find it, even when it's normal. But it is something to know. Temperature is also something to know. Are their legs warm? Are their feet warm? Are their toes warm? Do they complain of cold feet or uh, cold toes? And then there's some labs that you may, may want to look at, you may not want to look at. We usually don't. Usually, unless we look at it, looks infected, we usually don't culture chronic wounds because you will be guaranteed to have one or just a multitude of uh, bugs living in there. Um, but that, that's something to consider if you think it's um, if you think it's infected. The, the gold standard basically would be to do a tissue biopsy. We generally don't do that. What we do is irrigate the, um, the wound just with a lot of normal saline, using a 30 cc syringe with an 18 gauge angiocat. They understand through research that that will um, dislodge the germs that have an adhesive property and are kind of stuck to the wound. It, it'll it'll uh, disrupt them. So with plenty of water or uh, normal saline, it should, should be irrigated. And then to uh, culture it, you push down, push down a little bit hard, maybe hopefully breaking the, maybe the cells on the surface, holding it there for about five seconds or so, and sending that for culture. But generally we don't culture a wound, uh, at least the first time, unless it looks infected. Even then, many times not. Uh, we don't usually culture it because there's usually such a variety of, of germs, and you have to chase after them. Um, if you suspect, if it's a, let's say there's a, a history of a compound fracture 20, 30 years ago, and the, the, the person comes, the veteran comes in to you, the patient comes in, and they say, uh, well, I've had this wound for two, three, four years, and it's just not healing. And it's right up by the compound fracture. Well, you have to at least think of osteomyelitis. And so you might want to get uh, a CDC, a CRP, a, an ESR, and, um, and, and check those for inflammation, infection, and such. Poorly healing wounds, there's a variety of nutritional problems that can be going on. But the big one, of course, I always think of is protein, <coughs> albumin, 
You might want to get a pre-albumin, see what kind of nutrition they have, especially if that's in doubt. With the diabetic, you want to know, hey, what kind of control has your diabetes been under? The, the one where it's not under control, you know that those high blood sugars affect the white blood cells. Macrophages are kind of the, you might call them the um, general contractor of wound healing. They're the ones who stop certain factors, um, call for other factors to come to the wound healing uh, party. And um, high blood sugars are going to cause those macrophages not to behave properly. We want to know what kind of control the, the person's under as far as diabetes is concerned. Also, a person who's had long-standing diabetes out of control, that's going to tell us there's a high risk for atherosclerosis, uh, neuropathies, things like that. So all this stuff kind of plays into it. Um, yeah, so those are just a few of the, the labs you might be concerned about. I want to check this. Uh, are they anemic? Stuff like that, too. Some imaging you might need to consider. Is there a foreign object in there? When you're taking the history of how long the wound's been in there, what did you know caused the wound? You need to keep your ears open. Is there a possibility of a foreign object being in there? You can do all the wonderful, great wound healing you want, and if there's a foreign object in there, it's just going to fail again and again. you got to get in there and get that foreign object out. Another thing, you could be looking for um, a, a fracture, like with the Charcot foot uh, slide. You might be looking for a fracture. If there's a history of uh, um, compound fracture, you might be, this might be your first step to uh, investigate for osteomyelitis. Um, when you have, if you probe, if you probe bone on a diabetic foot ulcer, that's osteomyelitis until proven otherwise. So that'd be another indication for getting um, an X-ray. And again, going back to the foreign object thing, with with the neuropathic foot, you're not going to be uh, the patient could easily step on something that could be embedded in their tissue, and they don't know about it. So imaging, and then there's the MRI and the, the CT also. Looking for uh, osteo. Any questions on that assessment so far? There's not a lot of you guys in here, so we can ask questions. Oh, I have one. Yes. Uh, in Texas, have you have you found that there's a lot of men that lose the, the hair in the front of their shin because of boots, boot wearing? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. Just I mean, wanted to make sure. That's that's a good point. <laughs> right. So you, so you do all this assessment and stuff, <laughs> and you ask yourself. Is it related to disease or is it related to the environment? Yes. Okay. So that's, that's a good point. You've got to use your common sense. Very good. Uh, another thing you want to assess for is uh, pain. I don't think that's up there. But you want to assess for pain. You want to assess the quality of pain. Is it, is it a little bit? Is it a lot? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it throbbing? All these things can give you clues as to what could be causing the pain. When does it hurt? And again, the better assessment you do, the more questions you ask. I mean, it just really narrows your, your, your thought process down as you get closer to diagnosing, as you get closer to looking at things. A lot of times without even looking at the, the wound, you, you are on, on a good trail in the right direction just by asking the right questions. More about pain. So is it a lot, is it a little bit sharp, dull, is it throbbing? When does it hurt? Do you, does it hurt when, you're, when you get up in the morning? Does it hurt at night? What helps the pain? With the, with the venous disease, we're gonna see more pain um, in the, when they get up out of bed. All of a sudden, during the night, all the swelling's gone down, the pressure inside the, the leg has gone down. They stand up in the morning, and some people even talk about how they can feel the blood come down, and they get this throbbing pain in their foot. It hurts a lot in the daytime. It goes away at night. Now, the arterial uh, pain will be almost the opposite of that. And, and at night, uh, this is the person who has the, the low blood flow. Maybe they have 30% blood flow. Uh, in the day, they're feeling fine. When they're sitting up, they're feeling fine. At night, they wake up in about an hour or two, and their, their leg is just killing them. And so you, they, what they do, they, they say, you know what helps though? If I just kind of drop it 
on the side of the bed and so let it hang uh, on the side of the bed during the night. Those kind of things. Or pay attention to the, the spouse who's there and said, you know, he's always hanging his bed off the bed. Or you're watching the patient who's laying in the supine and instead of having both feet up on the exam table, they have one hanging down. Those are all kinds of hints telling you something. What is that all about? And again, with the arterial, uh, the ischemia uh, component, when you <coughs> put it down, of course, that um, gives the body a little bit of help on getting the blood delivered to that, that lower extremity. And then you have the, the, the pins and needles, uh, a lot of time nighttime pain with uh, neuropathy. They fell asleep. a little bit more about assessment. Um, there's a couple other things we want to assess. It's called uh, monofilament testing. How many people have done monofilament testing? Yeah, this is this is very, very helpful, especially with a neuropathic uh, wound that you're not sure if it's neuropathic or not. cheap to buy, and, uh, but, but what these things tell us is we, we test them on the plantar surface of the foot, basically uh, the first, third, and fourth uh, head of the uh, metatarsal heads, and then the, the big toe and the small toe uh, plantar surface. And what this does is it tells us, does that person have what's called protective sensation? Meaning, if that person hurts that area, blisters it, steps on a tack, are they, is, there, is that going to alert them um, that there's something going on? Do they have protective pain sensation down there? This is real easy, but it it's really should be done with your, with your patients who come in with the lower extremity, especially, if, let's say, a foot wound. You just simply put it, uh, press it perpendicular to the surface and just push it until it bends and hold it for a second or two. The way to do this is you... Um, you explain to the patient what you're going to do, maybe even test it on their, their, their hand, show them what you're going to do, that you're going to just kind of push it, for a, hold it for a second or two, and, and bring it back. And um, you want them to say yes when they feel it. You have them sit in a comfortable position, foot up, close their eyes, and then just go through um, the different areas, pushing perpendicular, flexing the uh, on filament and then taking off. If they if they miss them, if they can't feel it in certain areas, then they have loss of protective sensation. Okay. Okay. Here's a this is a, this is a very um, this is a, a super important assessment uh, tool you need to use on all your lower extremity chronic wounds. And the reason is, you may not have a purely neuropathic wound. You may not have a purely uh, venous wound. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a fair chance you won't. And this is the way it's picked up. This is something that can be done in the office a lot of times. And it's a very accurate test and easy to perform test. It's called an ABI or um, I have arterial brachial index, it's angle brachial index. And basically what it is, it's the, um, you take the blood pressure in the ankle and you 
you put that over the, the best of the two blood pressures in the brachial arteries. So what you do is you, uh, for this test, again, it can be done by uh, a nurse, it can be done by a uh, provider. You simply need a, a handheld doctor. I have brought mine here, just like this. Very compact and easy to use. You need a little uh, ultrasound gel. And you need blood pressure cuffs. Things that are found in most doctor's offices, in most clinics. What you do is you, you use the Doppler and you determine the uh, systolic blood pressure in both arms. You have brachial blood pressure here, brachial here. And whichever is the highest of those two, that's going to be the number that goes in the, um, your, uh, the formula there under C. It'll be uh, the brachial blood pressure, whichever is highest. And then for the ankle, you'll do each foot respectively. You'll do two different places of the blood pressure in each foot. On the right, uh, so on the right side, for instance, you'll do, you find that pedal pulse or about where it is, and you, you do get the blood pressure there. Again, you're just working with the systolic. And uh, you actually don't get a diastolic with a Doppler. And then um, you also get the posterior tibial uh, blood pressure. That's basically right, right behind the uh, medial malleolus. Whichever of those two is highest. So you do, the, on the right foot, you do, uh, you get the two blood pressures, the, the salus penis and the uh, posterior tibial blood pressures. Whichever is highest, that's the one you plug into the, um, the formula. And that gives you what's called your ABI, arterial brachial index. This is important because this helps us uh, know right away, hopefully right away, does that person have sufficient arterial uh, blood pressure in his feet or do I have to worry about something? We have the normal up there. The normal you'll find is so 0.9 to 1.3. A borderline would be 0.6 to 0.8. And this will come in, these, these numbers, will revisit them in the next hour when we do the, our, the second hour of a presentation. Um, severe ischemia is considered under 0 0.5. Critical ischemia is 0 0.4 or below. Also, interestingly, there's an abnormally high one, and that's, especially in diabetes, diabetics, or folks that have atherosclerosis, you need to be uh, cognizant of this. And what this reflects, if you get a high ABI of above um, 1.3, there's probably calcification that's occurred, especially the person who has chronic illness like cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes, and it's not, doesn't, so then the ABI really doesn't tell us much. Okay, we can't depend on it. So we have to do another test. We have to um, get our vascular consult sheet out and fill it out and say to the, um, Vascular lab, we would like an ABI and what's called a TBI. And TBI, what does TBI stand for? Does anybody know? Now, some of these here from polytrauma, they say traumatic brain injury. That's not what it stands for. It, not in this lecture. What does it stand for? It stands for this is, this is a toe brachial index. Okay, a toe. And what toe? The big toe, the great toe. That's the toe. And what we do with the TBI. This is more accurate. There's smaller blood vessels, smaller arterioles, and we we actually do blood pressures on the big uh, the big toe. And uh, they don't calcify as soon in, in uh, like with diabetes as the the more proximal larger vessels do. So this is actually accurate. And so with a person who has a 1.3 TBI, person who has diabetes, they go to the vascular lab, or ABI, they go to the vascular lab and get a TBI done. And we don't want to do things, and we'll talk about this in the next session, but we don't want to do things like compression, static compression, things like that, if, a, if we don't know what kind of arterial circulation the patient has. And so we send it to the vascular lab and they get TBI. Okay. There are not too many contraindications to this, but there, there are a few, well, or, or some things you have to be conscious of. Certainly if a, a patient is in lots of pain, they, um, like they have a painful ulcer right next to where you're taking the blood pressure on the ankle, 
um, you, you need to consider um, maybe having them premedicated or have them take their medicine um, before they come and that's going to be taken. You don't want to do a uh, blood pressure right over an acute DVT either uh, out of fear that it might be dislodged. Those are with the ABI, then those, uh, those are pretty, pretty much precautions or the contraindications. Very, very important though, whether you have a, you, you, you know you're dealing with a venous wound, you think it's maybe arterial, it's going to help you diagnose that, or you're dealing with, you're dealing with a neuropathic wound. Um, you want to know what the ABI is, you want to know their, um, their arterial circulation. Listen, imagine you're doing all the great wound care in the world on your venous ulcer, and it's just not healing. And as a matter of fact, it's getting bigger, no matter what you do, okay? And, and you haven't checked their ABI, and this person has a, an ischemic leg, too. Wasted, uh, a lot of time has been wasted. Patient um, has not gone down the right path. Uh, when they should have, besides being treated for venous stasis, uh, they should have also been sent to vascular to see what vascular surgeons can do with it. ABI is super important. And also, we don't want to, there's a couple other things with ABI. We want to know what, what kind of circulation is going down there. And we'll visit the same point the next hour. Uh, we want to know what kind of circulation is going down into that extremity because with venous hypertension, for instance, or venous stasis ulcer, one of the main parts of therapy is compression. And you don't want to compress, we don't want to compress a leg that has, uh, that's ischemic, that has a limited amount of uh, uh, arterial blood being delivered. Because that extra compression may just um, shut it off. So we always want to know what the ABI is. Okay. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about wound differentiation. This will kind of slide into the next um, hours, too. But wound differentiation. We're not talking about these today, but there are other ones that, that you may see in, in the clinic or in your practice. Uh, these are some, some typical ones, but they can kind of stand out. And sometimes, and, and we've been tricked by this too, uh, a few months ago we had a typical, actually this is a picture of, of the atypical one we had. Um, this guy had venous hypertension or venous stasis. And so we thought, well, is it, that's what's happening here? But it was really one of these atypicals. So it's always good to remember there's some atypicals out there. And there's others because, besides these, but we have the vasculitis. And you see vasculitis, it's usually pretty rapidly progressing. And it's, um, many times it's associated with a person who has, already has an autoimmune disorder. So if you're seeing uh, a very painful wound with a person who has an autoimmune disorder, it looks really kind of odd, and it's fairly fast um, developing. This is a possibility of vasculitis. Pyoderma, pyoderma gran granosum is one you see with inflammatory bowel disease. So that this fellow here, um, who we had, he he was uh, he works in a um, a warehouse, and he bumped his uh, leg against a a shelf, and he gets a lot of stuff from like all different parts of the world, a lot of stuff from Southeast Asia, and he has um, venous stasis. He's never had ulcers before. He, otherwise, he's pretty healthy. But we did ask him if he had had any kind of like, um, inflammatory bowel symptoms before, the, 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 the diarrhea, the weight loss, the pain. Uh, no, 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 he didn't. Uh, he, he didn't have any of those. He doesn't have Crohn's. He doesn't have um, all sorts of colitis. Anyway, so we, we were doing all our therapy. We were doing everything we knew how. And another thing that was interesting about this is that thing hurt like the dickens. It was really, really tender. It doesn't look tender. But it was very, very tender, way out of contact for what we were looking at. Um, we've seen wounds like this before. With that boy, he is just a whiner. But uh, he wasn't whining. Uh, he really hurt. Um, it's a little unusual color, too. I don't know if you can see kind of a purplish violet ring around it. Anyway, so anyway, so 
we thought, oh, this is an IV thing. This is an infectious disease thing. He, you know, he gets all this stuff in from Southeast Asia. He's got some kind of weird germ. So he sent him to infectious disease. No, he didn't have any. He didn't have an infectious disease. We sent him to Durham. No, they couldn't. You know what it was either. Well, he did have. So it's, somehow, I don't know. This kind of stuff just kind of comes up once in a while. But he was talking about his um, his colonoscopy a few years ago. And that they had seen a bunch of small ulcers on the colonoscopy. They never bothered him, though. But, um, but every now and then he has kind of a subacute uh, ulcerative colitis type thing going on. And uh, so he did, he did, when you take that into consideration, did this, this did fit the, the, um, the whole picture of pyoderma. Another thing with pyoderma and vasculitis, and even with calciflaxis, is just the next one. All these have something called pathogy. Anybody know what pathogy is? Pathogy is a characteristic when you mess with the wound, it gets worse. Okay, Jenny and I love to get to debris wounds and get them nice and clean. That's because that's going to bring the wound along. The slough in the base of that wound is stalling it. Anyways, we would we mess with it a little bit and never did get better. Maybe it have gotten worse. And that's an expression of pathogy. And that's not supposed to happen. But anyway, all this stuff, when we understood that he did have ulcers in his colon, all of a sudden it all fit, and he did have pyoderma. And anyways, atypical. Um, Calciphylaxis is something you see with um, end-stage renal disease, and they have a hyperparathyroid uh, hormone in their blood, and it's very, very painful. Though these are people will come to you, actually they can have anywhere on their body the wounds can occur. We're talking about lower extremities today. So if that person comes to you with an extremely tender lower extremity wound, and a lot of times it has a black eschar um, crust on it. And the person's in stage renal, and if you measure their parathyroid hormone, it'll be a high parathyroid. Again, it has pathogy, and again, it, it's just something you don't want to mess with it because it'll make it worse. So again, that's the reason to, to understand there's any typicals on here. And then there's, of course, there's malignancy. This is, you should especially think of this if, if, it's, if it's an odd-looking wound or it's a wound that's not healing, even though you're giving it really top-notch wound care. It's growing bigger. Maybe they have a history of uh, something that would predispose them to uh, cancers. And then there's just pressure ulcers. We're not looking at pressure ulcers today, but that's something to think about. And to, to, um, you want to identify that right away. Of course, you have the the heel pressure ulcers that occur on the posterior heel, and it's the person who's, who's laying down. They might come into your office with an ulcer. They might come into your, house, uh, your office with a bruise, or it looks like a bruise, but it was really a deep tissue injury. You look at it, and it's, um, it's boggy, or perhaps it's hard. But it's right on the back of the heel. And when you evaluate the history, they've been laying down. And when they lay down, it's for, for an extended time, and their heels are flat. Uh, or laying on the, um, the bed. If you have a, maybe a patient comes in who has who has braces on their legs, and there's a, a chronic wound on on their leg, and when you come in, the, the braces are off. The nurses have taken them off. And you look at this wound, and boy, it sure is odd looking. And by the way, they do have venous hypertension because this person doesn't walk very much, so they don't have that calf pump always pumping the, the fluid back up. And so you look at it, and that's, that's an odd-looking venous wound. But um, you, you, you have to take the whole patient in, picture into consideration. You look over there by the wall, and there's a couple of braces. You want to take those braces and, and you know, line them up. Could this be a pressure ulcer from the braces? Is it right underneath where the braces or the straps go? Or is it, you know, that's impossible? Those are things to think about when you differentiate. So this is the end of the first hour. Would y'all like a five minute break? Or would you just continue? Yeah, we'll, take a, we'll take a five minute break and then we'll, we'll finish up. We'll take a five minute break. 
motor trips, burning lips, burning toast. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine, castles on the Rhine, the Parthenon, and moments on the Hudson River line.